In this video, we're going to read through Book 1 of Homer's Iliad, translated by Alexander Pope. Um, in the introduction video, I explained that while Homer wrote in Greek, of course, and used a meter known as dactylic hexameter, uh, the translation of Alexander Pope here is written in English in what's known as iambic pentameter. As I read this, I'm going to exaggerate the meter a bit, just so that it's clear that this is a poem and it has a meter and rhyme throughout the entire um, 24 books of the Iliad. As we go along, I'll also stop and make brief comments so that the characters we meet, maybe the places that we meet, um, will be understood as we read along. I'm not going to comment too much because a reading through one book will take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, and I, I can't afford to uh, have the video just you know lengthened unnecessarily by commentary. So we're going to get started. We're going to read through every book from beginning to end, and uh, part of getting through works like this is, is just the work of doing the reading. And I hope that by making these videos, uh, my reading will help you to get through them. And, uh, and you'll see that it's, it's, it's work, and it takes a good hour to an hour and a half to read through a book of Homer's Iliad. So let's begin book one of Homer's Iliad, translated into iambic pentameter by Alexander Pope. <clears throat> Achilles' wrath to Greece the direful spring, of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess, sing. That wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign, the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore. Since great Achilles and Atreides strove, such was the sovereign doom, and such the will of Jove. In that first passage, just a, a couple of things to explain. First of all, note the religious nature of classical poetry. Note that Homer here is invoking the help of a goddess known as a muse to assist him in the creation of this poem. He says, Achilles' wrath to Greece the direful spring of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess sing. He's asking the muse to assist him in the creation of this poem. Um, the other thing is that there are just names that we'll face, and I'd like to comment on them very briefly. Achilles is the main character of this poem. Um, he's a famous Greek warrior. Uh, the other name we come across here is Atreides. Atreides means son of Atreus, and the son of Atreus is the Greek king Agamemnon, who's the leader of the Greek army. All right, that's uh, the, other, the other note is Pluto's gloomy reign. Pluto is the god of the underworld, uh, also known as Hades in Greek. So the wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign is a reference to death and men descending into the underworld. So the theme of the poem is Achilles' wrath. Um, and Homer is seeking to investigate the cause and, and, uh, and reason for this wrath which caused the death and suffering of so many Greeks. He goes on in the next passage, again invoking the muse and asking for divine assistance with his poem. Declare, O muse, in what ill-fated hour sprung thee fierce strife from what offended Power. Latona's son. Latona is a, a goddess, and her son is the god Apollo. Latona's son, Apollo, 
a dire contagion spread and heaped the camp with mountains of the dead. The king of men, his reverent priest, defied. The king of men is Agamemnon. <clears throat> his reverent priest means the priest of Apollo, who we're going to meet in a couple of lines. The king of men, Agamemnon, his reverent priest, defied. <clears throat> And for the king's offense, the people died. For Chryses, that's the priest of Apollo, Chryses sought with costly gifts to gain his captive daughter from the victor's chain. Chryses, the priest of Apollo, is seeking his daughter, Chryseus, who is taken captive by the Greek armies. She's actually in the possession of of Agamemnon, the king. For Chryses sought with costly gifts to gain his captive daughter from the victor's chain. Suppliant the venerable father stands. Apollo's awful ensigns grace his hands. By these he begs, and lowly bending down, extends the scepter and the laurel crown. He asks, <coughs> he asks the Greeks to hear his plea on the authority of Apollo, showing them signs of his priesthood. He sued to all, but chief implored for grace, the brother kings of Atreus royal race. The brother kings are Menelaus, the king of Sparta, and Agamemnon, the king of Argos. They are two brothers. Um, they're sons of Atreus. And it's these two brothers who are launching, or who did launch, the attack on Troy because Paris, the prince of Troy, stole Menelaus's wife, Helen, from Sparta. That was the cause of the Trojan War. The brother kings of Atreus' royal race. Now Chryses, the priest of Apollo, speaks. Ye kings and warriors, may your vows be crowned, and Troy's proud walls lie level with the ground. May Jove restore you when your toils are o'er, safe to the pleasures of your native shore. But, oh, Relieve a wretched parent's pain, and give Chryseis to these arms again. If mercy fail, yet let my presence move, and dread avenging Phoebus, another name for Apollo, son of Jove. So he asks, have mercy on me, consider me as a father grieving for his daughter, and grant me the return of my daughter. But if you will not listen to my cry as a father, hear me for, uh, for Apollo's sake. So he makes this religious request for Apollo's sake that the Greeks would return to him his daughter, Chryseus. The Greeks, in shouts, their joint assent declare they agree the priest to reverence, and release the fair, the beautiful girl. Not so Atreides, not so the son of Atreus, Agamemnon. He does not agree. He, with kingly pride, repulsed the sacred sire, and thus replied. This is the cause of this entire trouble, that's explained in the Iliad. Agamemnon's rejection of Chryses' request for his daughter and his offense of Apollo. Here Agamemnon replies, Hence, get out of here, hence on thy life, and fly these hostile plains, nor ask presumptuous what the king detains. Hence with thy laurel crown, 
and golden rod, nor trust too far those ensigns of thy God. Mine is thy daughter, priest, and shall remain, and prayers and tears and bribes shall plead in vain, till time shall rifle every youthful grace and age dismiss her from my cold embrace. In daily labors of the loom employed, or doomed to deck the bed she once enjoyed, hence then, to Argos shall the maid retire, far from her native soil and weeping sire. Then, the trembling priest along the shore returned, and in the anguish of a father mourned. Disconsolate, not daring to complain, silent he wandered by the sounding main, till safe at distance to his God he prays, the God who darts around the world his rays. So now, having been disrespected and rejected by Agamemnon, Chryses prays to Apollo. O Smintheus, that's another name for Apollo. O Smintheus, sprung from fair Latona's line, thou guardian power of Scylla, the divine, thou source of light, he's the god of the sun, Thou source of light, whom Tenedos adores, and whose bright presence gilds thy Chrysa's shores, if e'er with wreaths I hung thy sacred fane or temple, or fed the flames with fat of oxen slain, God of the silver bow, thy shafts employ, avenge thy servant and the Greeks destroy. So Chryses prays that Apollo will avenge this disrespect and punish the Greeks. Thus Chryses prayed, the favoring power attends, Apollo heard his prayer, and from Olympus's lofty tops descends. Bent was his bow, the Grecian hearts to wound. The Grecian refers to the Greeks. Fierce as he moved, his silver shafts resound. Breathing revenge, a sudden night he spread, and gloomy darkness rolled about his head. The fleet in view, he twanged his deadly bow, and hissing, fly the feathered fates below. On mules and dogs the infection first began, and last the vengeful arrows fixed in man. For nine long nights, through all the dusky air, the pyres, the funeral fires that burned the dead bodies, the pyres, thick flaming, shot a dismal glare. But ere the tenth revolving day was run, inspired by Juno, the goddess, Thetis's godlike son, Thetis is another goddess, and her godlike son is Achilles, convened to counsel all the Grecian train, for much the goddess mourned her heroes slain. So Apollo in answering the prayer of Chryses, comes and sends a plague that destroys the Greeks and kills many of them, kills their animals, and is going through the camp. When Juno, um, Juno's the wife of Jupiter, she's the queen of the gods. She, she's on the side, she favors the Greeks, and she's upset seeing this plague killing them. So she moves um, Achilles to call together uh, 
a convention of the Greeks to try and figure out what needs to be done. The assembly seated, rising, or the rest, Achilles, thus the king of men, addressed. Achilles stands up and speaks to Agamemnon as this plague breaks out among the Greek soldiers. Why leave we not the fatal Trojan shore, and measure back the seas we crossed before, the plague destroying whom the sword would spear, spare. Tis time to save the few remains of war. But let some prophet or some sacred sage explore the cause of great Apollo's rage, or learn the wasteful vengeance to remove by mystic dreams, for dreams descend from Jove. Jupiter. If broken vows this heavy curse have laid, let altars smoke and hecatombs be paid. So heaven atoned shall dying Greece restore, and Phoebus, Apollo, dart his burning shafts no more. So Achilles gathers the Greeks and says to Agamemnon, we need to figure out what the cause of this plague is. Maybe someone has broken vows. Maybe the gods have been offended. We need to figure it out, and we need to make it right and end this plague, or else we need to go home, because we're not going to be able to fight anyway. He said and sat when Calchas thus replied. Calchas the wise, the Grecian priest and guide. That sacred seer, whose comprehensive view, the past, the present, and the future, knew. Uprising, slow, the venerable sage, thus spoke the prudence and the fears of age. So Calchas, a wise man, stands up after Achilles speaks and says the following. Beloved of Jove, Achilles, wouldst thou know why angry Phoebus bends his fatal bow? First give thy faith and plight a prince's word of sure protection by thy power and sword. So Calchas says, I'll tell you what the cause of this plague is, but Achilles, I need you to promise that you'll protect me when I do so because someone's going to be angry. For I must speak what wisdom would conceal, and truths invidious to the great reveal. Bold is the task, when subjects grown too wise instruct a monarch where his error lies. For though we deem the short-lived fury past, tis sure the mighty will revenge at last. So Calchas says, I, I will tell you, but it's going to make the king angry, so I need to be promised that I'll have protection, or else a wise man wouldn't say what I'm about to say. To whom Pelides, that's Achilles, the son of Peleus, replies, From thy inmost soul, speak what thou knowest, and speak without control. Even by that God I swear, who rules the day, to whom thy hands the vows of Greece convey, and whose blessed oracles thy lips declare, long as Achilles breathes this vital air. No daring Greek of all the numerous band, against his priest shall lift an impious hand. Not even the chief by whom our hosts are led, the king of kings shall touch thy sacred head. Encouraged thus, 
the blameless man replies, Nor vows unpaid, nor slighted sacrifice, but he, our chief, provoked the raging pest. Apollo's vengeance for his injured priest. Nor will the gods' awakened fury cease, but plagues shall spread and funeral fires increase. Till thee, great king, without a ransom paid, to her own Chrysa send the black-eyed maid. Perhaps with added sacrifice and prayer, the priest may pardon and the god may spare. <coughs> so Calchas tells, the, tells Agamemnon that the only way to get rid of this plague is to send the girl back to her father, Chryses the priest, and to do so at no cost. She's to be returned. And if that's done, and sacrifices of atonement are offered to Apollo, the plague will cease. So now, how does Agamemnon respond? The prophet Calchas spoke, when with a gloomy frown, the monarch started from his shining throne. Black collar filled his breast that boiled with ire, he was angry. And from his eyeballs flashed the living fire. And Agamemnon says, Augur, or prophet, Augur accursed, denouncing mischief still, prophet of plagues forever boding ill. Still must that tongue some wounding message bring, and still thy priestly pride provoke thy king. For this are Phoebus's oracles explored to teach the Greeks to murmur at their Lord? For this with falsehood is my honor stained. Is heaven offended and a priest profaned because my prize, my beauteous maid, I hold and heavenly charms prefer to proffered gold? A maid unmatched in manners as in face, skilled in each art and crowned with every grace? Not half so dear were Clytemnestra's charms. Clytemnestra is Agamemnon's wife. <clears throat> Not half so dear were Clytemnestra's charms when first her blooming beauties blessed my arms. Yet if the gods demand her, let her sail. Our cares are only for the public weal, the common good. Let me be deemed the hateful cause of all, and suffer rather than my people fall. The prize, the beauteous prize, I will resign so dearly valued and so justly mine. But since for common good I yield the fair, my private loss let grateful Greece repair, nor unrewarded let your prince complain that he alone has fought and bled in vain. So Agamemnon agrees to let Chryseis go, but he says that she needs to be replaced by a woman who is currently held by one of the other Greeks. So he's going to take someone else's woman in place of his. And then Achilles responds to Agamemnon. Insatiate king, Achilles thus replies, fond of the power, but fonder of the prize. Wouldst thou the Greeks their awful prey should yield, their lawful prey should yield, the due reward of many a well-fought field? 
the spoils of cities raised and warriors slain, we share with justice as we toil, we gain. But to resume whate'er thy avarice craves, that trick of tyrants may be borne by slaves. Yet if our chief for plunder only fight, the spoils of Ilion shall thy loss requite. When e'er by Jove's decree our conquering powers shall humble to the dust her lofty towers. So Achilles says, look, Agamemnon, you have no right to take anyone's rewards for war. If you need something, why not wait until we conquer Troy, and then you can have whatever you want. Obviously, the king doesn't like this, and he replies, Then thus the king, Shall I my prize resign with tame content, and thou possessed of thine? So I should give my prize up, but you shouldn't, Achilles? Great as thou art, and like a god in fight, think not to rob me of a soldier's right. At thy demand shall I restore the maid? First let the just equivalent be paid, such as a king might ask, and let it be a treasure worthy her and worthy me. Or grant me this, or with a monarch's claim, this hand shall seize some other captive dame. The mighty Ajax shall his prize resign, Ulysses' spoils, or even thy own, be mine. The man who suffers loudly may complain, and rage he may, but he shall rage in vain. But this, when time requires, it now remains. We launch a bark, a ship, to plow the watery plains, and waft the sacrifice to Chrysa's shores, with chosen pilots and with laboring oars. Soon shall the fair, the sable ship ascend, and some disputed, uh, some deputed prince, the charge attend. He's going to send the girl back to Chryses on a ship, with one of his men, leading, um, leading that trip. This Cretus king, or Ajax, shall fulfill, or wise Ulysses, see performed our will, or if our royal pleasure shall ordain. Achilles' self conduct her o'er the main. Let fierce Achilles, dreadful in his rage, the god propitiate and the pest assuage. And then Achilles responds. At this Pelides, the son of Peleus, which is Achilles, frowning stern, replied, O tyrant! Armed with insolence and pride, Inglorious slave to interest ever joined, With fraud unworthy of a royal mind. What generous Greek, obedient to thy word, Shall form an ambush or shall lift the sword? What cause have I to war at thy decree? The distant Trojans never injured me, to Phythia's realms no hostile troops they led, safe in her vales my warlike coursers fed. Far hence removed the hoarse resounding main, and walls of rocks secure my native reign, whose fruitful soil luxuriant harvests grace, rich in her fruits and in her martial race. Hither we sailed, a voluntary throng, to avenge a private, not a public wrong. 
So what Achilles is saying to Agamemnon is, you have to consider who you're talking to. We're voluntary soldiers who came to help your family deal with a private problem. Paris took the wife of your brother. In my homeland, there is all peace. I have no problem with the Trojans. We came here to help you, and now you're going to treat us like this? What else to Troy, the assembled nations, draws? But thine, ungrateful, and thy brother's cause. Is this the pay our blood and toils deserve, disgraced and injured by the man we serve? And darest thou threat to snatch my prize away? Due to the deeds of many a dreadful day, a prize as small, O tyrant, matched with thine, as thy own actions, if compared to mine. Thine in each conquest is the wealthy prey, though mine the sweat and danger of the day. Some trivial present to my ships I bear, for barren praises pay the wounds of war. But no, proud monarch, I'm thy slave no more. My fleet shall waft me to Thessalia's shore, that's his homeland, left by Achilles on the Trojan plain. What spoils, what conquests shall Atrides gain? In other words, if I pack up and go home, you're done, Agamemnon. If left by Achilles on if left by Achilles on the Trojan plain, what spoils, what conquests shall Agamemnon gain? And to this Agamemnon responds <clears throat> Fly, mighty warrior, fly. Thy aid we need not, and thy threats defy. There want not chiefs in such a cause to fight, and Jove himself shall guide a monarch's, shall guard a monarch's right. Of all the kings, the gods distinguished care, to power superior none such hatred bear. Strife and debate thy restless soul employ, and wars and horrors are thy savage joy. If thou hast strength, t'was heaven that strength bestowed. For no vain man, thy valor is from God. Haste, launch thy vessels, fly with speed away. Rule thine own realms with arbitrary sway. I heed thee not but prize at equal rate thy short-lived friendship and thy groundless hate. Go, threat thy earth-born Myrmidons, but here tis mine to threaten, prince and thine to fear. Know if the god the beauteous dame demand, my bark shall waft her to her native land. But then prepare, imperious prince, prepare. Fierce as thou art to yield thy captive fair, even in thy tent I'll seize the blooming prize, thy loved Briseis with the radiant eyes. <clears throat> Briseis is the name of the girl in Achilles' possession. Hence thou shalt, hence shalt thou prove my might and curse the hour thou stoodst a rival of imperial power. And hence to all our hosts it shall be known that kings are subject to the gods alone. So Agamemnon 
doesn't care if Achilles threatens to leave. He says that he's going to do what he wishes because he's a king and he, as a king, has the support of the gods. Achilles heard with grief and rage oppressed. His heart swelled high and labored in his breast. Distracting thoughts by turns his bosom ruled, now fired by wrath and now by reason cooled. So Achilles is struggling because he's filled with anger and rage towards Agamemnon, and yet he has to be careful and control himself. And so he's going back and forth between this angry rage and cooler reasoning thoughts that prompts his hands to draw his deadly sword, force his way through the Greeks and pierce their haughty lord. He's considering killing Agamemnon. This whispers soft his vengeance to control and calm the rising tempest of his soul. Just as in anguish of suspense he stayed, while half unsheathed appeared his glittering blade. So he's going through this difficult time, restraining himself from attacking Agamemnon. <coughs> and so what happens at this point is the gods come to assist Achilles. Minerva, that's Athena, the goddess of wisdom and of war, the daughter of Zeus. Minerva, swift, descended from above, sent by the sister and the wife of Jove. For both the princes claimed her equal care. Behind she stood, and by the golden hair, Achilles seized, to him alone confessed. A sable cloud concealed her from the rest. He sees, and sudden to the goddess cries, known by the flames that sparkle from her eyes. Descends Minerva in her guardian care, a heavenly witness of the wrongs I bear, says Achilles, from Atreus's son, Agamemnon. Then let those eyes that view the daring crime behold the vengeance too. And Minerva responds to Achilles, Forbear, the progeny of Jove replies, to calm thy fury. I forsake the skies. Let great Achilles to the gods resigned, to reason yield the empire o'er his mind. By awful Juno this command is given, the king and you are both the care of heaven. The force of keen reproaches let him feel, but sheathe obedient thy revenging steel. For I pronounce and trust a heavenly power. Thy injured honor has its fated hour. When the proud monarch shall thy arms implores, and bribe thy friendship with a boundless store, then let revenge no longer bear the sway. Command thy passions, and the gods obey. So Minerva comes, remember, Minerva is the personification of wisdom. Wisdom comes to Achilles and tells him to think, to think. The gods favor both you and Agamemnon. They're going to work out a solution. Don't turn to vengeance. Put your sword away. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Trust in the gods and do good. Do not return evil for evil. Wisdom tells Achilles. And to her, Pelides, Achilles, says, With regardful ear, 
Tis just, O goddess, I thy dictates hear. Hard as it is, my vengeance I suppress. Those who revere the gods, the gods will bless. He said, observant of the blue-eyed maid, that's Athena or Minerva, then in the sheath returned his shining blade. The goddess swift to Olympus flies and joins the sacred senate of the skies. Just a brief comment here. Here we have a beautiful look at Greek religion. And what's, what's to be said bad about it? You have <clears throat> a man who's been wronged. He's filled with anger. He's reasoning back and forth what he should do. The gods come to his assistance and give him wisdom, encourage him not to return evil for evil, encourage him to be patient and trust in the gods. And then he is calmed and comforted by the uh, promises made to him by Athena, and he puts away his sword, and there's peace. We see how the Greek religion works. We see what the gods do in terms of their relationships with men, how they inspire men <clears throat> to virtuous deeds. And so we have to be careful when we criticize Greek religion. We have to remember that Divine revelation was not given to the Greeks. They were working by reason alone. Um, this is 1,200 years before Christ, so we can hold them accountable to no Christian standards of moral behavior or religious beliefs. These are Greeks living by reason, outside of Israel, away from divine revelation, and all they have to guide their religious thoughts and their moral thoughts is the faculty of reason, their experience, and their investigation of the natural world. So when we judge the religion of the Greeks, let's judge it in light of the context in which it developed. From what I see there, that's good religion. Is it true? No, of course not. But that's to be revealed by God, for no one can know God without divine revelation. But to see this uh, intervention of the gods to promote peace, to discourage violence, to encourage Achilles to calm his anger and think carefully, that's nothing but good. <clears throat> so Athena, or Minerva, which is her Roman name, she returns to Olympus, which is the mountain where the gods were said to dwell. <clears throat> And Achilles agrees to put away his sword. Nor yet the rage his boiling breast forsook, which thus redoubling on Atreides broke. O oh, monster, he says, mixed of insolence and fear, thou dog in forehead but in heart a deer, he calls him a coward, in heart you are a deer, deer run away any time they see anything. When wert thou known in ambushed fights to dare, or nobly face the horrid front of war? Tis ours, the chance of fighting fields to try, and thine to look on and bid the valiant die. So much tis safer through the camp to go and rob a subject than despoil a foe. Scourge of thy people, violent and base, sent in Jove's anger on a slavish race, who lost to sense and of generous freedom past, are tamed to wrongs, for this had been thy last. Now by this sacred scepter hear me swear, which never more shall leaves or blossoms bear, which severed from the trunk as I from thee, on thee bare mountains left its parent tree. This scepter formed by tempered steel to prove 
an ensign of the delegates of Job. He has a sign that he was visited by the gods. From whom the power of laws and justice springs, tremendous oath inviolate to kings. By this I swear, when bleeding Greece again, shall call Achilles, she shall call in vain. When flushed with slaughter, Hector comes to spread the purpled shore with mountains of the dead. Then shall thou mourn the affront thy madness gave, forced to deplore when impotent to save. Then rage and bitterness of soul to know this act has made the bravest Greek thy foe. So here Achilles swears to leave the Greeks and no longer assist Agamemnon. 